when we're talking about Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. They so need to finish that up. conversation for sure. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, they keep, they're going up higher and higher, and they're showing themselves. That's and right. it's embarrassing. That's right. It's embarrassing. Keep up the fight. Thank you so much. Yeah, a lot of Love thank to you. come back. Yeah, thank thank you so much. You, you, yes, sister. Thank you as well, Bertha Lewis. It's a pleasure as always. Reverend Al Sharpton always says, the leader that you're looking for is in the mirror. Just look for him, all right? I'm Bob Slade, sitting in for Rev. Thank you very much. The convention continues. Keep it in here with Reverend Al Sharpton. I want to thank all the folks behind the scenes, our executive producer, Fatim Muhammad, our technical producer, Lee Majors, on-site engineer, uh, Kirk Tanner, and Millie Khan, who's in the background, writing things down, putting things on. As I always say, we'll see you next time. Adios. The views and opinions expressed on this broadcast are not necessarily those of WGCV, 620 AM, its staff or management, or our parent company, Glory Communications Incorporated. Get ready. Armstrong Williams is up next on WGCV, 620 AM, where knowledge is power. I knew something had to give. I was overweight, I didn't exercise, and my doctor told me I would most likely develop diabetes if something didn't change. Did you Fortunately, sign that document I joined a program that helped me make healthier choices, like eating better and being more active. Well, why isn't it in the group here, experience was really inspiring. We dealt with challenges many of us were facing and shared ideas on how to overcome them. The YMCA's Diabetes Prevention Program was a wake-up call that really changed my life. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, if current trends continue, one in three Americans could have diabetes by the year 2050. The Y's 12-month lifestyle modification program is part of the CDC's National Diabetes Prevention Program, and the goal is to prevent the onset of type 2 diabetes by reducing body weight by 7% and participating in 150 minutes of physical activity per week. Take control of your health. To find out if the YMCA's Diabetes Prevention Program is available in your area, and if you qualify to participate, visit ymca.net slash diabetes. A public service from the YMCA of the USA. This is Al Shops, and I'm keeping it real on WGCV 620 AM, KC Columbia. The sweet potato pie. Mm, mm, mm. Even the keenest taste buds will tell you the best food on the planet. Large enough to serve you and small enough to know you. So get the Henry's at 5431 Indian Head Highway, Oxen Hill, Maryland, or give us a call at 301 749 6856. Welcome to the Armstrong Williams Show, brought to you by Golden Crust Bakery, the fastest growing Caribbean-owned franchise in the United States. Golden Crust is committed to the delivery of quality food and excellent customer service. Visit them today at goldencrustbakery.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. Thank you so much for joining us. Logan Delaney, welcome back from the motherland. Well, thank you, Armstrong. Good to be back. Good show last night, Logan. Good show. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, listen, Armstrong, we don't strive to have bad shows. You know, you, you, you strive for every show to be better than the last. It's only an acknowledgement that you're getting wiser and better. <laughs> well, thank you. It's only an acknowledgement, Logan Delaney. That's all it is. Michael Maddock, how are you today? I'm great. I'm strong. How are you doing? Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty good, actually. Michael Maddock uh, is CEO of Maddock Douglas, which advises Fortune 100 players like GE and Walmart. You know, I, I, I start reading 
these bios and what the guests are going to talk about early on in the day uh, is interesting. Um, uh, this is interesting. We're taking a moment to consider today's largest, most recognizable companies, Logan's. Some of them won't be around in the next few years because they are suffer a NASTA moment, uh, according to our guests. Uh, and NASTA was a rule-breaking company that paved the way for iTunes and the complete disruption of the music industry and so when someone like Napster who has no business being in your business come along and puts you out of business <coughs> they call it a Napster moment and so Napster moments are happening more and more often is what our guest Maddox co-author of the free ID monkey um, talks about so um, so talk about the Napster moment and you're saying companies won't be around. I, I think you're talking more in the genre of technology. Uh, actually, technology is making it happen, but it's happening in all kinds of industries. So Napster was the company that started uh, to put the the record industry on on its heels. They were give all of a sudden they were giving away free music, and uh, at the time, actually, one of the largest record executives said, uh, you know. Uh, that it, it, Clive Davis was on uh, uh, on Howard Stern show a couple weeks ago, and he said, "Man, Napster, we didn't think they were that we didn't we we didn't think they were worthy of being swatted. They were like a mosquito, and they came right along and changed our industry overnight." So you said it. We say uh, when someone with no business being in your business comes along and puts you out of business, what's happening is um, people have using technology can take advantage of trends much more readily. So there are tensions in the market. There are new ways for consumers to get what they want more readily, and um, and they and they get it. And what happens is these big companies in industries like healthcare and higher education and publishing and travel. I mean, you're in media. Look at this. Look what's happening to newspapers. They're going away uh, because why? Because people are getting content on YouTube, people are publishing their own content. That's what a Napster moment looks like. And there are some symptoms that I can go through if you'd wish. That, that it'll, if, you, if you wonder if you're about to be Napstered, I'll give you some symptoms um, that will keep you up at night. Well, just give us the symptoms. Okay, so some, if, if, you're, if there's regulation increasing, it's becoming more complicated to do your business. If there's great consolidation, your competitors are starting to consolidate. There are fewer traditional entrants people aren't getting into. Your margins are shrinking. There's higher competitive pressure. Uh, product complexity is increasing. There's a flight to the high end, which is another way of saying that uh, there, are, there are more and more underserved people. You know, that, uh, a good example is insurance. We wrote a book recently called Flirting with the Uninterested. And in insurance, uh, their insurance agents have been calling themselves financial advisors for a long time. And when they come to your home, many of them now want to sell you whole life, an annuity, etc. And they're not real, many of them are no longer interested in younger people uh, and they don't have anything to sell them because the margins aren't uh, good enough. So along come these online insurance companies that are that you know you can click and buy. And you know in insurance land, when you talk to Gen Y and we did, the seventy seven percent of them say that the options are overwhelming. Um, seventy five percent say that uh, insurance agents sell stuff they don't need. sixty eight percent say that they really don't care about their customers. And, the, and, you know, the average Gen Y now is in their 30s. So that is a sign that there's a whole industry that is potentially about to be Napstered. And, uh, and, and it'll be someone that has no business being in their business that puts them out of business unless the industry wakes up and does something about it. Logan Delaney? Armstrong, this is not a new phenomenon. No, it's not. Uh, you know, it's I, re not. I recall being in business school classes back in the uh, se early 70s, and we had what we called then the buggy whip phenomenon. Yep. Okay? And when the automobile came in, if you were in the buggy whip business, you had a pretty good business right before the automobile came. Amen. If you stuck with the buggy whip business, uh, you didn't have a, a, a long business life left to you. And I, I love the saying, you can't read the label when you're sitting inside the jar. 
And what we see is that if you've been working on a challenge, be it a buggy whip or medicine or financial services for six months or longer, you start to become an expert. And that expertise means that you know what works, you know what customers want, you know what you can sell, you know what you've tried in the past. You know, you know, you know. And unfortunately, that knowledge, that expertise keeps you from seeing possibility. You, you literally don't see an opportunity when it's walking right in front of you. And that's why someone that has, has never been in your business before can come along and go, well, why don't we do this? So you look at companies like Amazon or Netflix or eBay or CarMax. These are companies that are run by CEOs initially that weren't from the industry that they disrupted. They just came along and said, hey, what if I sell direct? And, you know, I'll just add to that. I, I believe that business to business, B2B is dead. It's dead. And what I mean by that is not, the, not selling through business to business channels, but the idea that if you go to your customers, your business customers, and ask them what they want, more than often they're now wrong. You need to go to end consumers and understand consumers um, the changing needs of the impatient consumer much more readily. And the company that knows how to do that better than their competitor wins. And that they might choose to sell through grocery stores or a B2B channel, but they'll make the, an informed decision and they'll be telling that channel partner what they ought to be selling at what price and why, and they'll be right. Uh, so let me, let, me, um, let me delve in this. I, I'm looking closely because I don't want to get too into this before we go to a break but um you know this is really about innovation and it's also about preparing yourself for people like these the naps and the naps to the moments because you know the, the thing about business they can last 100 years but they die and so others can sprout up and grow a new economy it's sort of like my farming concept and plant my garden that traded tree's been there for 50 years and has done well for me but now there are other things that need to grow and need light and that tree doesn't produce as much as it used to, so I need to cut it down so something bigger can grow and more expensive. So mm-hmm. isn't that, shouldn't we be able to prepare that? Isn't that what, a part of what, what being an entrepreneur is all about? Well, I, there's, you know, I've spent the day sitting with young entrepreneurs, uh, and, and I'd like to think that I still am one, although age is catching up with me. I, I believe in the entrepreneurial dream. Believe me, I, I think that I have nothing but tremendous optimism and hope for the role of entrepreneurship and technology and making things better. However, there are people like, like doctors. You know, what, what is the role of a doctor when you can pee in your toilet and your toilet says, hey, you're sick and this is what you need and I've already called in a prescription for you? Because that technology exists today. Where's the doctor in that? And unfortunately, in many of our systems, we're going to the doctor to ask them what's next in health care, and, and they are being incented not to see it, or they don't see it. They just don't see it coming. If you think about how your, your dad and my dad took care of their car, they would take it to the dealer. They would take, it's like going to the hospital when you're sick. They'd take it to the dealer. They had someone that would fix everything. Now, you take your car to just tires, uh, just batteries, Jiffy Lube, and, and that's kind of the future of healthcare. And when you go to those places, a machine tells you what's wrong, with, and, they're, and it's, it's becoming more and more right. So it's not that technology is bad. It's just that sometimes our expertise keeps us from seeing that, that uh, things have changed. The earth has moved under our feet, and we, need to, you know, we have to be more aware of the, uh, the changing needs of the consumer and how technology can serve them. Um, you know, Logan, how often have you had to go back to the drawing table and redraw it? Uh, our story happens almost every day. Almost every day. Hold that point. Almost, almost every day. Almost every day. Um, G. Michael Maddock is our guest. Logan Delaney is in the house. Is your industry about to get Napster? CEO offers tips for organizing to innovate. We'll be back. Say bye-bye burgers, pass on the pizza, forget the frangs. Anytime is party time. Discover Golden Cross's authentic Jamaican-style patties. Beef, chicken, vegetables, soya, spinach, and shrimp. Mm. 
Feast on our great taste sensations. Jet chicken, ox scale, sliced fish, and much more. Savor the taste of the Caribbean. Only at a Golden Crust near you. A family tradition since 1949. GoldenCrustBakery.com For more information on the Armstrong Williams Show, please visit our new website at www.RightSideWire.com There you can find his syndicated column archive, view live streams, and get your favorite conservative pundits' views on the current issues affecting the American people. From building wealth to foreign policy, stay connected with Armstrong Williams and his colleagues at the all-new www.RightSideWire.com. Hi, this is Armstrong Williams. What does it mean to be conservative? Freedom of speech, freedom of free enterprise, freedom of assembly, less government, less taxes. As a matter of fact, a flat tax. Everyone should pay proportional tax. It doesn't matter whether you make a hundred million or ten thousand. Everyone should pay their ten percent. Everyone should have something at stake in this American economy. I'm Armstrong Williams expressing what we mean by conservative traditional value. Does your school, team, church, or charity need a new fundraiser? Do you need to work out of your home or part-time? Are you a small business that can use an additional revenue stream? Then you need Yellow Llama. Do you need affordable web services or tools to enhance your existing business? Are you a graphic artist who wants to create a revenue stream with your art but not get ripped off? Then go to www.yellowlama.com. America must change course if we hope to survive and save the American dream for our children and grandchildren. How do we fix Social Security and Medicare? How do we cut government spending? How do we reform health care? How do we simplify the tax code? The Heritage Foundation has a bold plan that tackles these tough problems using common sense solutions that leave partisan politics on the sidelines. Find out how we can save the American dream at savingthedream.org paid for by the Heritage Foundation Hi, this is Armstrong Williams with an opportunity to own a piece of paradise in Nassau, Bahamas spectacular land prices 8,000 square feet 20,000 square feet lot affordable prices hilltop properties with views of the magnificent sea just call 242-677-3120 or 3121 or go to info at rightsidewire.com and leave your information. Where heads of state, sports, entertainment, and political celebrities meet, you're listening to Armstrong Williams. And our uh, very distinguished guest, G. Michael Maddock, Logan Delaney. You're saying every day, Logan, every day? Look, Armstrong... Every day when you're in business, you have course corrections. And if you don't have a course correction every day, you, 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 you're doing something wrong. And you have to be responsive to the market. And the market changes every day. Every, every time you come across a customer, you have to be responsive to that particular customer's need. And, you know, you know if you look at it long term, you know, I, I saw an interesting statistic a number of years ago which looked at the number of Fortune uh, uh, 500 companies that were in existence at the end of World War II, and how many of them are still in existence and in, in, in their present form. And surprisingly, it's less than 20% of the companies that were around uh, 70 years ago are still around today in, the, you know, in their current forms. Yeah, the, actually, the, the average, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to build on that point. The average lifespan of a Fortune 500 is less than 40 years. It's half a lifetime. Right, right. And, and so what, you know, what happens, you know, if you look at successful business, what makes for a successful business is somebody who responds to the market, who responds to technology, uh, who responds to their environment. And... You know, one of the wonderful things about capitalism is something there's uh, uh, a great economist called Schumpeter called creative destruction. And that is, if you're not responsive to the market, you, you die. And, but 
more importantly, when you die, something better takes your place. It makes the economy, it makes society more productive. It makes it richer. Uh, and it's, it's sort of like uh, uh, nature you know, or a farm. Uh, you, you have a garden, uh, and in the uh, spring you plant, in the, and in the summer you flourish, and in the fall you, you wither and you die in the winter. And then you come back, okay? And it's this sort of constant cycle. That's the way life is. Uh, you, you get something better each year. You grow stronger, uh, or the economy does, you know, or, or a garden gets stronger every year. It looks better every year when you take care of it, and you let things die a natural death and then replant. And you have what's to prune. In, and what's interesting about the, the, the big companies uh, having their own Napster moments is that they become conservative and, and the, the market actually conspires. Quarterly reports conspire to make sure that they're running at, you know, we got to hit this number this quarter, this number this quarter, this number this quarter. So they become really good at squeezing efficiency out of the model they have. But, you know, when, you, they, say, when you say large companies, you give the impression that it doesn't happen to small and medium-sized companies. Well, what hap- the, it, it, I, they, have two, they have opposite problems. From my experience, small and medium-sized companies tend to be more entrepreneurial. So they, you know, when you have an entrepreneurial mindset, you're so often looking for new opportunities that you don't get around focusing on one thing or two things that matter most. In other words, you're, you're drawn to new ideas to the point of distraction. And, on, and with large companies, they're drawn to efficiency. And, and when you train, when, you, when, you, when, you, when Jack Welsh came into GE, and Six sigma everything. I mean, he was, he, the, the pendulum swung to the point where they are the best, one of the best companies in terms of process and mitigating risk. The challenge is that you need to be able to take risk. You need to be able to fail forward in order to be inventive. And, you know, there's a quote that I'll, that, you know, talking about GE and the light bulb. Uh, you know, the light bulb wasn't invented by iterating the candle. You have to jump off track and do something different. You have to take a chance. And so it's interesting how big companies uh, squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and become you know, incremental in their ideas. And small companies are the ones who will go, well, I'll just try something different because they have less to risk. The real action is actually with companies that know how to, uh, you know, how to focus and take risks, and they've become very good at it. And, and, and there are companies that know how to do that. They do it consistently. So there's hope for, for small companies and big companies. I, I just think it's interesting that these giant companies that have so much leverage and so much money and so much power can be caught unaware by little upstarts that, that have no business being in their business. And let, me, I, I let, me challenge, let me challenge, let me challenge your Please. assertion. Okay, so you're saying to me, and what you're saying is actually practical. There's no doubt about this, and there's a lot of real, real realism in it. But however, um, you're also implying that if companies were not so much playing it safely, if they were more, if they were less concerned about efficiency and the stability, and, and was more uh, prone to take more risk, to be bitten a little bit, that companies like Napsters and these other things that take companies out that come along would be minimized, almost non-existent? I would say they'd have less of an advantage, for sure. Give us an example of a company that's doing exactly what you're saying, a big company, and they saw what their competition was trying to do, squash them, and they've prevented themselves, and they're bigger than ever. Well, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Procter & Gamble. I have been for a long time. And what they did uh, many years ago was they started using different types of open innovation. They started, they, uh, their CEO came in and said, look, you know, you remember I said you, you can't read the label when you're sitting inside the jar. They had an unbelievable R&D team that was smarter than most R&D teams in the world. And he said, listen, from now on, I'm going to measure this. I want... X percentage of our ideas to come through you, not from you. In other words, he said, I want you to go out and look 
outside these walls at small companies, at technology, at things that are really cool that solve our consumers' needs. Stop inventing your own ideas and let's start looking for people that have already figured this out. And they wound up buying you know, companies that were spinning brushes and, and this type of detergent. They, they wound up looking for those companies and either emulating them or acquiring them. That's, that's the type of behavior that I'm talking about. But unfortunately, with many big companies, that you know, here I'll give you a great example. Uh, look at what's happening in education right now. You have you have these universities that are becoming college education in particular. Uh, five or six years ago, Ivy League schools were thumbing their noses at online learning, literally saying that's ridiculous. It'll never happen. Are you kidding me? And you can almost feel the college professors in their tweed jackets saying harumph, harumph. They don't know anything about education. And along comes Khan Academy, uh, you know, a, a, an investment banker whose sister asked him to coach his niece, and he said, I'll do something online. And now 4 million people around the world are looking at his stuff. It is unbelievable. Five-minute hunks of learning for free, for free. Now, what do you think that does to education? And I don't think any of us want to argue about whether our education system is working or not. Because it's got a, I, have t I have two kids, and, and we all want it to work. We all want it to be better. But there are, there are tens of thousands, well, millions of well-meaning teachers who, who won't let go for a better grip. While some are saying, hold on a second, we've got to change. So that's a great example of how, things, how industries get mastered almost overnight. You know, I, I, to be provocative here, I think having companies be Napster is a great thing because mm -hmm. I'm perhaps less uh, optimistic than you are that most companies can reform themselves and, and get new ideas. You know, companies get into a rut, you know, like you say, you know, they're in their jar uh, and, and they can't see outside what they're doing. And in, in one sense that's good because you know, they do become very good at it. But from society's point of view, what difference does it make whether company X survives? What is important is that the overall service has evolved or the product has evolved and that somebody's providing that and, and, and providing it at a low cost and, and, and high quality. And if it means the companies have to die, then the company should die. Yeah. And I think just if you, if you look at how... Uh, and, and, the, and the education establishment is a perfect example of how it's virtually impossible to reform from within because people who are in that business, unless they're owners, and there's a huge difference between a shareholder who owns a majority stake in his company and how he's thinking about the business and it, he's running his business, okay, and a manager who's getting a big, fat salary, okay, uh, and, and nice bonuses, uh, they have very different incentives in terms of increasing their wealth. And the guy that's in there who's just getting his fat salary uh, doesn't have the same kind of incentive to reform and take risk uh, that uh, an entrepreneur might have. Well said. I, I agree with you. I, I, I'm not... Uh, okay, so just let's, I'll just stay in my parent role. So as a dad... And as an inventor, I want the best education my kids can have. And when they get sick, I want the best health care that they can have. And so whatever means that the world, the entrepreneurs or big businesses make that happen, that's what I want. My stand is that there are, that there are big companies with incredible leverage, lots of dollars, and the ability to make that happen much more quickly if they open their eyes and are aware. But the business models that they've built, the expertise that they've built over time, too often gets in their way. And that creates a clearing in the garden, <laughs> the entrepreneurial garden, for young entrepreneurs and sometimes old entrepreneurs to come in and say, wow, doesn't anybody else see this need? I'm going to do something about it. So, I mean, it is a, it's a great tension, actually. Hold up. Michael, um, I think there's another interesting aspect. Well, Logan, it's going to be Kathy. even more interesting if I don't get out to this break. Uh, Matt, <laughs> can you stay with us? <laughs> yeah, sure. No problem. Thank you. <laughs>
We're coming back on the other side of the break. Don't go away. Armstrong Williams are streaming live with 866-620-6620. We'll be back. Armstrong Williams returns. For more information on the Armstrong Williams Show, please visit our new website at www.rightsidewire.com. There you can find his syndicated column archive, view live streams, and get your favorite conservative pundits' views on the current issues affecting the American people. From building wealth to foreign policy, stay connected with Armstrong Williams and his colleagues at the all-new www.rightsidewire.com. Life is full of unexpected changes. Everyone has potential to do wrong. And when they choose to do it, contact the Buxell Group for your private investigation needs. TheBuxellGroup.com or by phone at 202-243-9746. Whether there's an instance of a cheating spouse, child custody, process service, or security, don't continue suspecting. Get closure so that you can move on with your life. Visit TheBuxellGroup.com now or call 202-243-9746. If you think it's happening... It probably is. To travelers along the road of life who have fallen asleep at the wheel, to the many who woke up in time to avert disaster and get back on the righteous path. For the ones who crashed and survived and now adhere vigilantly to a virtuous and righteous path. Finally, Armstrong Williams' much-anticipated new book, Reawakening Virtues, gives his insights into these daily challenges and much more. Reawakening Virtues is available in bookstores and at Amazon.com. Join the millions of Americans who pursue one of our country's finest traditions, from hunting to sports shooting. Since 1871, the NRA has grown as a service organization involved in all aspects of shooting sports and is a proud defender of the Bill of Rights. Join today to begin taking advantage of exclusive membership offers and discounts, including up to $25,000 in insurance coverage. Contact the NRA today. Call 1-800-672-3888 or visit nra.org. Most Americans simply have never been taught the basics of money management, let alone how to secure their financial future. But there is hope. Financial Education and Literacy Advisors, also known as FILA, does what others don't. FILA teaches financial education. If you'd like more information about providing a financial wellness program for your employees, or a credit-bearing college course in personal finance, or other valuable programs, please visit MyFILA.com. That's M-Y-F-E-L-A dot com, or send an email to info at MyFILA.com. Elder Chicks is an exciting part of the fastest growing segment of the population. Women in their 70s, 80s, and older who are mastering the art of a senior life. We're no longer unseen and unheard. We're providing role models for each other and the baby boomers who are fast approaching retirement. Join our virtual community. Hit www.elderchicks.com on your computer keyboard. Where heads of state, sports, entertainment, and political celebrities meet. You're listening to Armstrong Williams. So back to the show. Um, G. Michael Maddox, CEO of Maddox Douglas. He advises Fortune 500 companies like G and Walmart. Logan Delaney. Logan, please continue. You know, one of the big impediments when a company becomes big towards innovation is something I call crony capitalism. I mean, it's not my term. It's a term that's in, in wide usage. And what they do is that they set up barriers to entry to, to really stifle an innovation. Uh, I mean, you can look at uh, all kinds of companies that do this, uh, you know, whether it's a utility company uh, that, that tries to, uh, to, to keep other communication companies from uh, getting television stations, whether it's a newspaper which uh, tries to put up barriers to entry to getting other newspapers in their market, Everybody, you know, if it's a doctor who they, the, the doctor organizations and the, and the uh, legal organizations put up uh, licensing practices ostensibly to control quality, but really to control uh, the supply of their services. Uh, I see it done in industry. I see it done in services. I see it done in education. People, when they become, they get a certain degree of success, they buy off the politicians. They get regulations imposed um, uh, to, to keep others out or to, or to make it much more difficult for others to, co- uh, to come in. I mean, look at the pharmaceutical industry and what happens with generics. Yeah. 
I agree with you. I, I and and I, but I, but I do. To your point earlier, I think that technology and you know you hear a lot about social media. My stand is that everyone has always been social. We need to separate those two words. We are social people globally, and now we have technology that makes it easier for us to tell each other the truth, to uh, to draw straight lines between what we want and how to get it. And that is opening up a world of possibility. Uh, you know, there's a, um, I like to say that advertising and marketing has become the tax you pay for a bad idea. It used to be that big companies could spend their way into getting you to buy things. You know, the more I advertise this type of product, the more people will buy it. Now, what happens is when someone has a really profound innovation, they put it up online and their friends tell each other about it. So they have to pay much less money in advertising and marketing um, for a greater effect. So the companies that know how to listen to the needs of their consumer and respond to them with something that's novel and, and differentiated uh, don't pay that innovation deficit tax. They don't have to pay as much marketing and advertising dollars, and they have a head start and competitive advantage over the others. So it, it's, a, it's an amazing time we're living in. And it's very exciting for the enlightened leader, be they in a small company or big company, that knows how to find an opportunity and put something new and relevant there. So, you know, I, I guess the, um, the, the, the where I'd like to um, sort of move this conversation is um, it's about innovation and why some have it, some don't. Some don't pursue it. Some don't understand the importance of it. And, and what is some of the innovation of the future that is untapped? Okay. Well, first, let's talk about what innovation is. <laughs> I, I think it's a very popular word right now. But when we look, so we've been in business. I started this company 22 years ago. So for a couple decades, we've been helping companies you've heard of figure out what's next. And innovation, from our experience, is if you think of three circles that are intersecting, it, the first circle is a need in the market, a, a significant need, and, and we've already talked about how sometimes experts don't see those needs. The next circle that needs to intersect is an idea, a novel product or service or business model that fills that need. And then finally, there's, a, there's an experience, a commercialization uh, experience that makes people say, my gosh, uh, that you listen to me and I'll pay you this much for it. And those three circles, the insight, the idea, and the commercialization experience have to meet for, for innovation to happen. What people get confused about is they think invention is innovation. And an invention is when you start with an idea. I've got this really great idea. And then you go looking for someone that needs it. And that's, you know, that's how entrepreneurs often fail. So you have to start with a need. You have to be able to see a need. Then you have to put a new novel idea there, and then you have to know how to launch it. That's innovation. Um, and there are a myriad of reasons why, why companies fail to, to, uh, to make that happen. But I would, I would say that one of them is because they say the word innovation, but they don't really understand that there's a definition and a process that's been proven to get you there. And, you know, I just gave you the macro version of it. But um, there are many people that do exactly what you just described, but they don't realize that it's innovation. And innovation, in my, you know, to some people, innovation sounds so expensive, so time-consuming. It involves much more than, some, than you. You've got to go outside of yourself and even to bring this into full, full mode to, to make it work. Mm -hmm. Is that unfair? Uh, that's the, I think that's the perception, but I think innovation happens every day. Uh, we just don't realize that some people do it intuitively. Some people uh, have learned how to do it over time, um, but most people don't really understand what it is. But I would say, Logan, I'd like to hear your input. I don't like it when you're quiet. Input to <laughs> innovation, to me, is more instinctual than anything else. It just happens. Well, that's because God gave you the gift of intuition. Right. The challenge, it, yes. well, it's true. 
It's yes. true that some people have intuition and they sense a need and they and they can come up with a solution that meets it. That's great. That, and and for a for a, an entrepreneur that's risking their their you know their college their kids college savings or their you know their play money, that's no big deal. But when a when a larger a mid size company that works on instinct and they get it wrong, or worse, a large company, that's a hundred million dollar miss. You know, so so it it can't be intuition, at, at, it just can't at a, at a at a large company because you miss too many times, and then you're you lose the uh, you lose the the faith of your shareholders, and the market turns on you. Uh, the good news is there are proven processes around innovation. It, there are companies that have been doing it. Uh, for for years, it just became a popular word in the last few. You know, I had I, I like to I like to add to that that innovation is something. Most innovation is is incremental. It comes in very very small steps. You know, somebody, you know, the the, the innovation that goes from the candle to the light bulb is 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 more unusual than the innovation that takes the incandescent light bulb to the LED. Uh, which is more incremental and involved a whole lot of steps over the period of, of uh, 150 years to get yeah. there. Uh, yeah, I, and, I agree. Yeah, and 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 I think that people who uh, you know who who look at innovation also have to recognize is that there's just not physical, and I think Michael was pointing this out. There's just not physical innovation uh, that uh, you know somebody comes up with a new product. But there's innovation of how you get that product to market, how you get people to think about the product, how you get to, uh, you know, the, the intellectual property, like in software. I mean, software, if you think about it, what is software? Software is, is somebody sitting down and, and writing a program that does something slightly differently. Yep. And it it. It requires a lot of incremental, the very few programs, almost no programs, start from scratch with binary language. They start on the basis of, you know, binary language to machine language to, you know, whatever the, the, uh, the language is, whether it's C++ or whatever, uh, and, and, and it comes from a need. You know, listen, and, Logan, you know, listening to you, uh, this is interesting because I'm realizing in this conversation, um, uh, it's something I never thought about actually, listening to you and Michael, is that business innovation and financial innovation is not the same. Because if you think about the financial innovation, you think about all these terms that were just created. I mean, the junk bonds, the credit default swaps, the securitization, the index funds, the currency swaps. And you, I could go on and on and on. And, and what they're saying to you, what they say to you in the financial innovative space is that you innovate or die. And, and that the phrase that popularized actually in Silicon Valley in the, in the 1990s, and, it's, and today is sort of um, the mantra throughout the business world. And nowhere has it been more popular than on Wall Street, which in recent years has churned out a seemingly endless stream of new ways to manage capital as slice and dice risk, and we pay a price for it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm sure that there are plenty of people on Wall Street that, that, that would argue that they had a need and they found a novel way, a business instrument. Of course you would say need. that. Of course. Yeah. Wait, wait, hold on. Well, I'm, no, I'm going I'm to intervene here because I happen to be very much involved in the junk bomb market. Oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> boy, a a here. We struck it up, <laughs> Michael Melkin, back in the 80s. I can tell you how the junk bond market got started. It, the junk bond market got started because companies failed, okay, and somebody had to buy those bonds. And what we found out is that while... Let me go to break. Hold up. I'm coming to break. But let me say this, and I'm glad I get to say it. While Silicon Valley's innovations have brought enormous benefits to society, I'm going to say this. The value of Wall Street innovation seems a lot less clear. We'll be back. Say bye-bye burgers. Pass on the pizza. Forget the frangs. Anytime is patty time. Discover Golden Cross's authentic Jamaican-style patties. Beef, chicken, vegetable, soya, spinach, and shrimp. Mm. 
Feast on our great taste sensations. Jerk chicken, ox scale, sliced fish, and much more. Savor the taste of the Caribbean. Only at a Golden Cross near you. A family tradition since 1949. GoldenCrossBakery.com For more information on the Armstrong Williams Show, please visit our new website at www.RightSideWire.com There you can find his syndicated column archive, view live streams, and get your favorite conservative pundit's views on the current issues affecting the American people. From building wealth to foreign policy, stay connected with Armstrong Williams and his colleagues at the all-new www.RightSideWire.com. Does your school, team, church, or charity need a new fundraiser? Do you need to work out of your home or part-time? Are you a small business that can use an additional revenue stream? Then you need Yellow Llama. Do you need affordable web services or tools to enhance your existing business? Are you a graphic artist who wants to create a revenue stream with your art but not get ripped off? Then go to www.yellowllama.com. Anderson Brothers Bank, a family-owned and operated establishment that blends traditional personal service, local market awareness, and advanced technology to meet the financial needs of its customers. Visit abbank.com or call 843-464-6271 to see how they can assist you with your banking needs. Anderson Brothers Bank, celebrating 75 years of community banking, the way it should be. Stability right in your backyard since 1933. America must change course if we hope to survive and save the American dream for our children and grandchildren. How do we fix Social Security and Medicare? How do we cut government spending? How do we reform health care? How do we simplify the tax code? The Heritage Foundation has a bold plan that tackles these tough problems using common sense solutions that leave partisan politics on the sidelines. Find out how we can save the American dream at savingthedream.org, paid for by the Heritage Foundation. Join the millions of Americans who pursue one of our country's finest traditions, from hunting to sport shooting. Since 1871, the NRA has grown as a service organization involved in all aspects of shooting sports and is a proud defender of the Bill of Rights. Join today to begin taking advantage of exclusive membership offers and discounts, including up to $25,000 in insurance coverage. Contact the NRA today. Call 1-800-672-3888 or visit nra.org. Where heads of state, sports, entertainment, and political celebrities meet, you're listening to Armstrong Williams. Callers, I apologize, but it's about to get hot up in here with uh, our two guests. I'm calling Logan a guest now, along with Maddox. (laughs) Douglas, because let me tell you something. I want to just say this. You know, I'm so glad we're having this discussion because a light went up in my head. I will never forget when the bank tried to tell us the most valuable new product they were going to add with this thing they called the ATM. And and then this Valley gave us this microprocessor and Google this thing they called the iPad. And then the street gave us, what was it called, um, the CDO and the ABS and the CDS. And not to mention that kind of computerized trading, Logan, that enabled... Um, stock markets to those nine the, and well, so this whole, no, let me just say this this whole notion of financial innovation has been looked at with a jaundice eye even by congress if you consider the various ways they're trying to rein in the excesses of the banking industry i'm sure i'm i'm, I'm going to say you're beginning to sound like one of those populists you know who's trying to run for office no i, I never thought about market. this it's not even something okay, I've and, the reason, before. and the reason i say that is that i've been very intimate uh, in the in the uh, junk bond market. Oh, give me and, comfort. Okay, and in the junk bond market, it was called junk bonds because originally it got started financing companies, or, or they, they were trading bonds for companies that had failed. And what we found out at Drexel, and it was basically Michael Milken who did this innovation, he found out that there was a market of underserved companies, companies who were middle-sized and small companies who had no access to the public markets because they weren't big enough and they weren't uh, uh, investment-grade credits. So we started financing these smaller, middle-market companies with, quote, junk bonds out of this market, and we financed thousands of companies 
that would not otherwise have been able to get into the public market. And, you know, how, much, how many jobs do we create? How many, you know, how much innovation do we create? by do that. I mean, it's a lot. It's huge. Uh, I, you know, I'm with you, Logan. I, I, I'll I jump know on you that. are. I know I you are. Hold on a sec. I, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a junk bond expert, and I could, I, could, uh, I could run either side of this argument, but I will say as an entrepreneur that started multiple companies that financial instruments make innovation go. So I, and my, I, I, I took a shot at insurance earlier, but I will tell you that, that um, you know, life insurance, by way of example, commercial insurance, by way of another example, mitigates the risk for entrepreneurs and businesses alike that, that, that they take the sting out of the risk to, to innovate. And I think that without those financial instruments, uh, innovation wouldn't happen. I mean, I just to, to boil it down to the, uh, the, 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 the simplest terms, it, I, if I was putting my family at risk every day um, without life insurance, for example, I'd probably be working a desk job somewhere because it would be too much risk to put that. I'm fine taking risks myself, but what about my family? So, I mean, there's a, there's, there are two sides to every one of these coins. And I, uh, now just switching sides of the argument, Armstrong, oftentimes what we see is an innovation that started well-intentioned is then misused. You know, it's, it's, it's taken advantage of. And, and, and that's where you, you know, these financial instruments, for example, get a bad name. And if someone, if there is an insurance agent that's selling something to a friend that they wouldn't buy for themselves, there's a problem. You know, so, what I don't understand is why people put the financial industry to a higher standard than the jewelry industry. I mean, if your wife walks in to a jewelry store and sees a diamond that she can't afford to buy and... and the the uh, the jewelry saleswoman sells it to her, you know, convinces her to buy it. Nobody criticizes her, but really? you know, if an insurance salesman, you know, <laughs> in, in, encourages you to buy some insurance policy that you can't afford or mortgage backed security, I mean, you know, what happens? You know, why can't you take the blame yourself because you were too stupid or uninformed or didn't do your homework and you did something stupid? We all do stupid things. Like buy the diamond we can't afford, okay? So I'm going to say that you can't protect people from their own stupidity. <laughs> but I think you're missing something here. You're being unfair here. I'm not missing anything. Talking, listen, some what of these, instru- some of these you instruments, come you on now. You're being dead. Look, 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 you're better than that. You're better than that. Many of these, the these instruments <laughs> was put in place to fleece people. Come on, That's man. That's not true. They were corrupt. That's not true. Oh, they, were not, they, were, they were invented to solve a problem. They were well, invented to appeal to um, a certain group of investor that wanted to, you know, have a higher rate of return, wanted to mitigate risk, who wanted to have certain maturities, who needed to have a certain uh, uh, credit structure. These instruments had a purpose. There are people who may not have understood the, the, that and bought them, and it was inappropriate. But you can't blame the salesman for selling something to somebody that, uh, you know, they don't have a fiduciary obligation to you. The salesman's yeah. job is to sell stuff to you. I like it it's when your you job punish as, as a consumer to say, hey, this is not appropriate to my current station in life. You know, I, I like it when the free market uh, punishes companies for But at least, that if that is what it is, at least... Ethical. It sh- the the public, those who are not sophisticated, should not be a, um, taken for a ride, and their finances further eroded because they think they're getting something and, they're, and they're not really you know, getting the, what, the they, they, what is being promoted. You when you talk about these marketing done. people, if, you know, if if you tell the public, hey, you can't buy or you can't get a, a this mortgage because you're not rich enough or you can't and you're not sophisticated enough. People are going to be upset with you. I mean, one of the reasons why we had the housing crisis and CMOs is because Congress intervened. And Congress intervened by saying to the mortgage industry, hey, look, you've got to make these instruments available to people who are lower income 
and who probably can't afford them. Okay? I mean, that's what happened. That is the genesis of the subprime debt crisis. I, Congress. I, I will only say this, that not all of Wall Street's concoctions, because that's what many of them are, have been pointless or destructive. I think Logan makes a good point when he talks about Joe, Joe Barnes, who used Michael Milken's pioneering in the 1980s. Uh, they got a bad name when Milken went to prison for securities fraud, but his no, Michael insight... Went to, went, to business, went to prison for... Securities uh, fraud. For parking. For securities fraud. But... It wasn't securities fraud. But his... Okay, that's your perspective. We'll argue that. That's a different question altogether. Okay, but <laughs> let me make my in point. In your opinion. His insight... <laughs> That high yield bonds could be a good investment. That historically the rewards outweigh the risk. A lot of new companies, including eventual giants like Turner Broadcasting in my industry now and MCI, as well as countless small businesses, to raise billions in capital that previously would have been out of their reach. I will give them that. Right, arms. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Here's the thing. There's, y'all know what Nobel, the Nobel Prize. You know what Nobel came up with. Well, Come after they, after they gave it to the president for doing nothing, it just lost oh, no, its no, luster no. with but me. It, hold on, that, that, yeah, yeah, he's, 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 he's dynamite. Easy, yeah, he invented dynamite. He invented explosives. I know, I know. So, so, so the question is, um, is that good innovation or bad innovation? Good. And, it's good. Yeah, there's a. Well, okay. Uh, there were there are plenty of people that would argue the opposite end of that. I think that when you when you create an instrument. It can be used for good or evil. Absolutely, absolutely. And 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 you can you can and so I, this it becomes a we could we could be arguing about financial securities. We could be arguing about dynamite. We could be arguing about um, health care. You know, and, and so so it's it's a slippery slope. The, the I think there's a certain amount of ethics that's involved with good innovation where you're finding noble needs, I guess pun intended, uh, that, that, are, that are worthy of solving. And again, I like it when uh, there is a, a, a capitalistic society that corrects, aggressively corrects bad behavior. And I, you know, I, I'm trying not to take the bait on the uh, political discussion, but it gets pretty messy when the government jumps in and makes corrections uh, that, that keep that capitalism from happening. And that's all I'll say about that. All I can say is this, is this has been a very provocative discussion. And I'm telling you, it, we all should go back and re, uh, assess all the parts of this history when it comes to innovation. And yes, uh, um, and... And so the bottom line, it's, it's, I really appreciate this discussion because, listen, I love it when I learn something. It, it makes me go back and connect the dots because sometimes we forget. And we need to understand all of it, not just some of it. Yeah, and, and let me just say one more thing about I'm a big uh, fan of America in terms of innovation. And here, here's why. Here's why Americans, I believe, this is my opinion, right now for, for the time being, are better at innovation than anyone else in the world. Uh, number one, we're empathetic. We care about people. We, we look to solve people's needs. And you remember my definition of innovation. You start with an insight. You start with a need. You have to have empathy. You have to be trying to solve something for someone. We're good at that right now. And number two, and this is really important, culturally in America, it's okay to fail forward. We celebrate the entrepreneur. We don't lose face when we fail. In other cultures, if you mess up, and again, in big companies, if you mess up, you lose your job, you lose your reputation. But for today, anyway, in America, it is noble to fail forward. And that's why we're so good at innovation. So um, we should be proud. We should be proud of our ability to innovate. It's not going away anytime too soon. I encourage enlightened leaders, whether they be at big companies or small companies, to go find a need and believe they can solve it. Because um, they can. You know, we have the ability to do that right now at this moment in time. And I've really enjoyed talking to uh, Listen, both you gentlemen. You have no idea. Every part was important to today's discussion. And I'm sure our listeners, and I apologize for not going to the phone lines, have felt empowered. Thank you both so very much for your insights, your wisdom, and sharing your experience. Thank you, Armstrong. Thank you, Logan. Thank you. You're welcome. Good talking to you. For more information on The Armstrong Williams Show, please visit our new website at 
at www.rightsidewire.com. There you can find his syndicated column archive, view live streams, and get your favorite conservative pundits' views on the current issues affecting the American people. From building wealth to foreign policy, stay connected with Armstrong Williams and his colleagues at the all-new www.rightsidewire.com. America must change course if we hope to survive and save the American dream.